interesting topics, issues, and other situations. But just what? relax, don't yeah. worry about the camera. <laughs> okay. Q95 FM Radio, every Monday night from 8 p.m. in the Spotlast. One on one with interesting personalities, educational and informative topics and issues, intriguing and entertaining. A must listen to in the spotlight Monday nights from 8 p.m. on Q95. to the In The Spotlight radio show. It is Monday night and a beautiful Monday night it is here in Dominica. I hope it's beautiful in whatever part of the world that you are at this time. The Monday before last was a public holiday. And last week Monday, I was actually on a few days vacation and so I was not here, but I in fact arranged for a repeat program, and that was the program of Yvonne Alexander, the former policewoman, and uh, I still got some feedback on this one. I think this is probably the third repeat of that program, well, the second repeat of this program, if I'm not mistaken, and I still had some very new listeners and the persons who gave me feedback that that program was so inspiring and so touching and how much they in fact enjoyed it. So I preferred doing one of those rather than just leaving the airwaves empty without a program. So I hope you in fact enjoyed last week's program. But we are back live tonight in studios. And as usual, I would like to thank you for choosing the In The Spotlight radio show tonight. And I always, you know, ever so often just, uh, Mention my dad's name, Ferdinand Frampton. I never want his memory. I never want him not to be remembered. His memory has to remain alive for the contribution that he made to Dominica. And also the community of Point Michel as well. And his village, Pishler, where I'm also from. Good evening to the folks of Pishler. Want to say good night to Mr. Gregoire, who I met on the way up here, whom I must say from the onset embraced to me and this program. And I thank you, Mr. Gregoire, for not getting involved, for not you you don't you just do not get involved in this at all. And I really do appreciate this. You recognize that it's my program, and I do it the way that I want to do it, and I bring whatever guests that I want through the doors of your radio station. I want to say thank you to Josephine Gabriel and Company Limited, the Jenny and the team for supporting me uh, in, with this initiative, this program. Garraway Hotel, Dominica News Online, good night to your team. I know you're always locked in whenever you can. And the folks of Innovate Multimedia, a group of young men who do graphic works, videography, photography. And they support me and the In The Spotlight radio show. Again, good night to you wherever you are tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing us. You've made the right choice to be here for the In The Spotlight radio show. Kadisha is not here with me tonight, but I think that we should be just fine uh, with uh, our guest. I want to also uh, remind you that you can view the program live via my Facebook page. So you can join us here. We are already live and also via Q95's YouTube website. I was told via few Q95's website, you can also view the program as well. Tonight we have a very esteemed 
esteemed gentleman as our guest on the In the Spotlight radio show. I still call him Ambassador Crispin Gregoire. Mm -hmm. Keep it locked. So we're coming right back on the In the Spotlight radio show. It should be another wonderful program. Thank you again for tuning in wherever you are tonight. In the Spotlight on C95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight featuring people from all walks of Dominican life spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, aspirations, untold stories. Touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Getting to know our farmers, our public servants, youth, and the ordinary Dominica. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight, we'll also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. to our Dominican stalwarts who live outside of Dominica. I always remind our persons that whenever you are planning on visiting the island, uh, especially if you do not live here, if you're planning on visiting the island, or if you know of someone who should be on this program, who is making some plans to come back home or to visit, so let me know so I can schedule that person on and we can get to hear and share in their life story. And I happen to have heard that this gentleman here was actually on island at a sad time. I understand the passing of a member of his family. And um, I have him on my list. I have quite a list of persons that I add to every day. You know, I get suggestions of persons who should be uh, on the program, but remember, you know, I am a f I'm fully employed, I'm, f I'm full time employed. You know, sometimes it can be a bit difficult pulling things together for the program, but you know, I do have a list of you know persons that that that, that should be guests on this program. And so, I heard this gentleman was here, and I said, mm, perfect opportunity to get him to do his stint on the In the Spotlight radio show, and so I made contact. And um, he's here with us tonight in studios, and it is my absolute pleasure to have with us tonight to share his story. And like I said to him, you know, it's his story that we're here uh, to talk about. You know, we've heard him uh, quite a bit on the radio, more talking about one particular, you know, area per se, but tonight it's all about him and his story. Mr. Crispin, Ambassador Crispin Gregoire, good evening to you, sir. Good evening, Fernanda, and it's a, a great honor to be on your show, and um, thank you for inviting me. Let me say good night to your listeners in Dominica and in the diaspora. Um, it's really an honor to be here tonight. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to have you. I've heard so much um, <laughs> about you, and I, I've learned so much about the contribution that you've made. Um, here in Dominica, outside of Dominica, um, and um, people like you, we must remember and we must hear your story. We must learn how you did some of what you did. <laughs> we must try to learn from you. We must be inspired by you. I'm sure there's a motivational bone in you somewhere that you can, <laughs> yes. you can, you can help us out. And this is the purpose for bringing, uh, bringing persons on this program. We want to hear your story, sure. but we also want to learn from you. Yes. We also want to be inspired by you. We want you in some way to share with us your successes, 
share failures. Yeah, you know, things absolutely. are not always perfect, right. you know. And that is what we're here about tonight. And uh, it is a pleasure indeed to have you. I want to give you an opportunity to shout out the folks of Brandy in particular. <laughs> not just all, just the listeners, but the folks in Brandy. Because somebody already wrote here on Facebook, Brandy, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first person that I would, I would uh, say hello to in Brandy is UNICEF. Um, Philip Francis, a.k.a. UNICEF, he was the one who led the revolution that, over, that took not the Geneva Estate for the Grammy people. And, you know, he's one of my heroes. And, um, and to all the people on you know, Grand Bay, I don't know if they're listening, if they're hearing, um, but um, I'm glad to be in Grand Bay for this last week, and I'm here for another week, and it's, it's fun. I, I go to my farm every morning. You do? Uh, yes. I, you have a farm here? Yes, I plant turmeric. I, turmeric is the, I had, well, all my coconut trees have fallen. I had 60 trees and they're gone. I have to replant. I started replanting already. Um, I plant turmeric, which is a climate resilient crop, so the, the hurricane doesn't disturb it. So actually the crop is now in progress. By January we should have the new crop of turmeric. Interesting. Yeah. Now, you, your visit this time was um, to attend the funeral of a loved one. Yeah. Um, share with us, you know, who that loved one was yes. and, and what happened. Well, uh, for Diana, you know, um, I, I've lost three loved ones in, in four years. Oh. So I've basically had three funerals that I've been responsible for. And this one in particular, my, my second um, brother, he was 59 and he, he struggled with mental Ill illness from high school to, to when he died, and he actually died at the psychiatric ward. And um, with no parents, and he doesn't have any wife or children, I, I had to be the one to come here and make sure he's buried. Yeah. Well, what, but in terms of, of, of the, the, the illness that he suffered from, um, how, did, how did you deal with that? How did he deal with that? How did your family deal with that? And, and um, what, what would you say to, to anybody who's, who's, who's had to go through that or is going through that? Yeah, well, the first thing I, I, I learned from this was how to embrace somebody with mental illness. Um, did you understand what the, the mental well, illness Well, at the time, I was... Um, what I was about to go to university when this happened. So I was about, um, not quite, just about 18. And um, he was like three years, three years younger. And um, I, I, I noticed that he was acting strange. And he was a, he like third form, fourth form, I can't remember what form. But, but anyway, he, he had to drop out of high school. And, and over the 40 years, I saw there was a lot of pain because there were times when the police intervened because he was misbehaving, he was really not well. And, and I actually witnessed a policeman beat him with a baton over his head. So those things, I learned a number of things about the human condition and how you deal with people with mental illness. And it made me appreciate other people with mental illness. You know? and, but it was a struggle for both of my parents and we accepted that you know, he had mental illness and we just lived with it. But it was, you know, it, it had its challenges, yes. Mm -hmm. And so he passed on. Yes, he was admitted to the hospital, to the um, psychiatric ward, maybe about a few days before he died. And um, I actually have not seen the autos autopsy report, which I thought I would have had by now, um, so I could read what what the medical um, analysis is. But so I can't really comment on that part. But all I knew is that he one night. Um, he went to sleep. I don't know. He probably had medication, and he never got up. Yeah. My condolences yeah. to you and Thank your you. family. How did things go with the funeral? The funeral went very well, and I must say, I was truly humbled by the outpouring of of um, sympathy um, on Facebook. I still have not even replied to it. all the hundreds of people who who sent me sympathy on Facebook. I, I will certainly be responding to them maybe tomorrow. And then for all the Dominicans who at home who came forward in whatever way and expressed their sympathy either to me on the street. I was just truly humbled because people recognized me on the street. <laughs> I can't hide. But um, it, was, it was good. It was good. And it was like, for me, it's like he has joined the ancestors and I'm not mourning for him. It's like it was really about celebrating his life. 
um, and so you've lost four loved ones, three, three loved ones three in, in four years. Yeah. Tell me about those who are still <laughs> with us. <laughs> well, I have, I have um, two brothers left. I had one sister, well I actually had two sisters, the first one, the, the second one died when she was about a year and eight months because she had spi spinal bifida. She was born with spinal bifida, so she never could walk, so she died a year and eight months. And then my other sister, she also died tragically, she died in a plane crash in 1995. That was a plane that left Dominica for St. Thomas and never arrived, and they never found a plane. She and her fiancé and three other people on the plane lost. That was tragic um, for Diana because I was living in Nigeria at the time. And I had to figure out, how am I going to fly from Nigeria to Dominica? It's a long way. Um, at that time, there were no direct flights from Nigeria to the US. So I would have to fly to Europe and find my way. And I did. You did? Yeah, I did come down in, in that year. And, um, and then, you know, um, my, my, my father was the first to die in, in terms of my parents. For in 2014, and um, that what had an impact on me because I'm the first child, and you know, um, so uh, then three years later, my, my mother died last year. Um, I, um, I came to visit her, and you know, she had gotten a stroke, and you wouldn't believe the night before I left, I was to leave the next morning. She died just before midnight of that night. I was leaving the next morning. <laughs> I figured she didn't want me to leave, so. So I just stayed and my other brothers, we all got together and we, we buried her. And um, yeah. So it's been a challenge. But uh, you know, the thing I, I, I did, those things don't faze me because I you know you can't break down when, because somebody dies. You know, you've, got to, you've got to appreciate that person for what they did in their lifetime and just know that they've gone to join the ancestors. We don't know what that next world is. but. We do the best. You celebrate Earth. their life. Yes, we celebrate their life. That's what it really should be all about. Mm -hmm. So in terms of so your, your, your father has passed on, Yes. your mom has passed on, right. and you have two siblings? Two, two, siblings, two siblings left. Yes. That, two, two left. Yes, yeah, right. Two left. And where are those siblings? Are they? One is in Grand Bay. The other one, he actually moved to Dominica from Washington, but he's gone back to the U.S. for um, just his annual medical checkup. And, and when you know he's a he's a mechanic, so he does work when he's in the U.S. You know, and he buys parts and stuff to sell. So, um, so he is um, he'll be back here shortly, and then my other brother. So, yeah. But you do have extended family. Oh yes. Left in oh, absolutely. <laughs> For that, I come from a very large clan, which is the Bellops. My mother was a Bella, and and she came. Oh really? Yeah, she came from the Bellops that owned Grand Colibri Estate. The Hugh Bella was her father. You better had many children. And, um, on my on my father's side, the Gregoires, that's also a clan in the Grand Bay area, not only Lally, but also Bagatelle, and um, so there are a lot of Gregoires there. Um, I have an interesting set of grandparents because my grandmother came from Martinique. She was actually an evacuee from Mount Pele when Mount Pele erupted in 1902. And, and she came to, um, she had relatives in Grand Bay and um, the parents were to come a few days later, but the volcano erupted and the entirely, entire family on that side, my grandmother's side, all wiped out in the volcanic eruption in 1902. So she and her sister were the only two who came. And, and her sister actually, I don't know at what stage she got polio, but she, she had, for most of her adult life, and I knew her, she had polio. She couldn't walk straight up. She basically walked on the ground, you know. Yeah. But she and her sister came from Martinique just days before the eruption of the volcano. So I don't have that connection with Martinique mm -hmm. because that entire family is gone. Wow. Was gone in 1902. Um, on, my, on my mother's yeah, side, the yeah. Bellocks, um, you know, Hugh Bella owned Grand Colibri Estate, which is the second largest estate in Grand Bay after Geneva. And um, it's, an, it's an estate I'm trying to learn the history. Um, but the, the Bellocks owned that estate for a long time. Yeah, I don't know how many, how many years, but, but at least more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's quite tragic, though, yes. what happened to your, your is maternal. Right, my, 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 family. My, 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 my father's, my fraternal family. Fraternal family, yeah, right. fraternal family. Yeah. And, but but you, 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 
the two sisters did establish. Yeah, um, interesting that they only, each of them only had one child. Okay. <laughs> 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 the two sisters each had one child, and um, yes, um, I think both both children are dead now. Their 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 children are alive. So, for example, at the funeral, my cousin. Josephine Warrington, who lives in Guadeloupe, she is the grandchild of that lady who got polio. Yeah, okay. so yeah, so they still there. You know, we're around. So you still have some family. Oh yes, absolutely. Even what about you? Did you ever get married? Do you have uh, children? Yes, I did get married. I I went to university in the U.S. Um, in uh, I, I left in 1975 to go to school in the U.S. and um, when it was, that was 1977, I met this lady who was a medical student and she had actually been to Dominica for that summer to do an um, internship. And I didn't think any, we just met and somebody introduced me. And, and two years later, I met her again at the concert and we, we started dating and I eventually married her. That was my first marriage. Um, um, Dr. Cannon, she, we actually moved back to Dominica. It has always been my wish to come back after school. So immediately after I got a master's degree, I came back and worked for Save the Children for five years. Here. We, so my wife was, she was a pediatrician at, at um, Princess Margaret and we had a son who's named Mandela Gregoire. Mm -hmm. And um, so that marriage, we got married in 81. Actually, got divorced in um, 2002. And that was long, 11 years. Yeah, we, we, we actually separated for about seven years. And I didn't think it would happen again, so we just went our separate ways. Okay. And, um, then I, I guess I fell in love again. I got married to a Nigerian woman oh. I, who I met in Nigeria. And um, we now we have two children, two girls who keep me busy <laughs> and um, we live in New York okay. yeah but Dominic is our second home okay and I, I, I presume at some point you are going to come back um, to Dominica I would like to retire here um, you know every time I try to come back to Dominica something happens but when I did live here in, in, in 84 to 89 it was the um, Prime Minister Eugenia Charles was in power then um, there was a little bit of suspicion about my work. I was working to save the children and we were doing all these projects and a lot of work in the Kalinago territory and Maricot and Wesley and eventually in Pitt Savannah and limited work in Granby because the government didn't want us to work in Granby. So eventually the Prime Minister said to me that she, uh, she doesn't like all the community work I'm doing so she doesn't want me to do any more community work and at that point save the children closed and I left them. Okay, and, we, and we've got, we are going to talk a bit more about all of that yeah. um, a bit later on sure. um, in the program. Um, but in terms of, of retiring home, I think you will though. <laughs> I think, well, you know, point. I'm so entrenched in Dominica. I have a farm. I have more than one farm here. Although the hurricane, like everybody else, did get a blow from the hurricane. Um, but I like planting things, okay. you know. And um, I... I planted, I planted coconut trees in the 80s when I was living here. I think that's when I planted the 60 coconut trees. And, uh, most of them were the, 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 the tall ones for oil, right? And then I planted dwarf nuts on flat land and only to realize that they were affecting Domlek's lines. So Domlek cut most of them, you know. But um, I, part of my interest in, in agriculture had always been on the processing side because my grandparents, my father's family, they had... They made cassava, farina, and bread. And, um, they, they had what's called a platin. And that's where all the grandma people made their, their cassava, farina. And, and. So as a boy growing up, four years old, five years old, I would spend time at my grandparents' time when they were doing farina. They would go late into the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning. They're still making farina all night. I'm around, you know? <laughs> I also like going to my grandparents because they, I got to drink black coffee <laughs> as a child. <laughs> did you get, wait, wait, did you get the real black coffee the or, real, the, or the black coffee? Because that's what they gave us. No, it was the real black coffee, right? And then my grandfather made sure 
He doesn't, he would not let any milk in his coffee. So I learned to drink black coffee. And up to now, I still drink black coffee, <laughs> kind of that experience. But um, it was really a great experience, this being, watching my grandparents. I learned a lot from them because it was the place to go away from home. <laughs> you know, it was safe to go there and spend time. I could go there alone. Yeah. So we're going to talk a bit about outside of, of what you just shared. Life, yeah. growing up in... Uh, the community of Grand Bay. Yeah. Uh, but before we talk about the life part, tell us about Grand Bay. So many of us, you know, when we talk about the various communities that we're from, you know, we're very boastful about our various communities. I know those Grand Bayans <laughs> in particular are very well known for that. <laughs> well, they must have to me. <laughs> God, they will suck. <laughs> you know, there's this thing about Grand Bay people. That people are very proud. Yeah, you know, Grand Bay people have an inbuilt arrogance in them. You know, that's how I think. In a good way. Yeah, I know. it's a good arrogance. They not they just want to make it clear to anybody I'm not a walkover. So don't walk don't try to walk over me. And I don't know, I remember in the when I was going to high school, there used to be a, a gang. There were two gangs. One in Rosa called the Howlings. I've heard about that. Right. And one in the Grand Bay called the Cape Asa. Cape Asa and Howlings. And, right. And there this the k Pastor guys used to come down to town to fight for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I, I think of it back then, for that, there were no buses like we have today. There were these freaks on trucks that had a tailboard. So, Grandly boys would, um, would um, fight in Rosa and pick, pick up on these trucks. <laughs> yeah, these two gangs were there to fight in the market, you know. So, so they would come down to fight? Yeah, they'd come down to fight. <laughs> Uh, but um, but Grand Bay is a is a very atypical place because we um, it has a strong African aspect to it and that is where the patois is very strong mm -hmm. and you know Grand Bay people love to talk their patois and um, but Grand Bay people's lives were dominated by Geneva Estate for a long time. Now you don't hear about that because it's forty years forty four. Um, years going on when Geneva was finally liberated from uh, from whoever owned it and then the Grand Bay people finally got land. Because the, the whole thing about the uprising in 1971 was about land. That, that, was, that was the bottom line. It wasn't really against Nassif per se. Nassif happened to be the plantation owner at the time, but I think that could have happened to anybody who owned that plantation. Grand Bay people were, were hemmed in I mean, there was no land. You go to Grand Bay today, once you cross the Berico Ravine from Grand Bay, you'll see all these houses that they built in, um, in Center and, and um, Bolong and all of these places, Battapak, Balapak. That wasn't there before 74. Um, so the, the, that, that liberation that occurred there, and I must say with the support, the, the government at the time of Edward Oliver Lee Bland, then soon after, soon to be replaced by Patrick John, um, um, Prime Minister Patrick John, eventually succeeded Lee Bland. And all of that Geneva thing was going on from Lee Bland's time through Patrick John's rule before he became, before we, we, he became Prime Minister, but he was the Premier then. So the, there was a sort of, I would say there was a certain sympathy in the Libla Patrick John government for Grand Bay and for dealing with this land challenge. And even the commission of inquiry that was done into the uprising at Geneva said that land was a crucial issue. There was very little land for the Grand Bay people. And um, you know, Geneva had 1,200 acres. And so. That's a lot of land. But, but having said that, I think the other aspect of, of Grand Bay growing up was that this is a constant cultural dynamism that was there. You had people, you had Orion, the Queen of Ballet. You had a guy called Chim who was a master drummer. Um, then you had a whole set of other musicians like those who did jimping, like um, Mr. Sanson's band. So I was exposed to all of that. And then um, in my, teenage, my late teenage years, the emergence of Cadence music and Grand Bay playing a major role in it. So you had the Midnight Groovers, you had Black, Black Machine and some other bands, Funkadelics and a few others. And um, they, Grand Bay was just bubbling. I mean, we were having um, the first Harlem 
festival happened in Harlem, but Grand Bay also had a similar um, festival for Isidore one year with bands from overseas. And so it's a place that is kind of a boiling, it's like a cauldron that's boiling all the time. Um, today I could see that there's a gap there because a lot of our people have migrated. And even you can see that even with agriculture, because most of the farmers from Grand Bay migrated. No, so. Let us talk about is it a, or is it or was it a misconception that at one time people were fearful of going to Grand Bay? As a young child, I always heard about you know Grand Bay being although I'm just from the neighboring community of Fishland, yeah. but you'd always hear about people being fearful of going to Grand Bay and not wanting to go there because something would that bad would happen to them or they would get involved in some um, violent activity or, or would meet with violence that kind of thing. Was that a, a misconception? Was it a myth? And, and and if not, what brought that about? And how much has it changed today? Yeah. Okay. It's sort of a mix. Um, you know, <laughs> as I think back, there were a lot, one of the things that made people fearful of Grand Bay, there were always fights at dances. So, so a lot of people wouldn't go to Grand Bay, they, they wouldn't go to any social event there. And then there's also that part of the misconception side that Grand Bay has the most voodoo in Dominique. <laughs> you know, people tell you about the $5 fight in the street. I never saw that, so I don't know about that. But, um, but so there is a fear that Grand Bay had a lot of, of wizards and witches and all of that, and that's why Grand Bay people are bad and so on. But I, I could say that, you know, part of the, the makeup of the character of Grand Bay people is that we are people who are very much influenced by the Maroons. You know, the, the Grand Geneva had a large Maroon movement, and the, the Grand Bay people have stood up many times, even when the, there were slave riots on Geneva. The, 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 the Africans on Geneva rebelled more than once. And um, even in 1844, after slavery ended in, 1840, in, slavery ended in 1838, after the apprenticeship system was over then in 1838, and in 1844 they wanted to do a census, the British, and the, the, slavery, the former slaves in Granby said, no, they're not going to allow it. And there were riots, not only in Granby, but the whole west coast of Dominica, all the way to Polyho had riots. All the, all the plantations from Polyho to to Point Michel and then to Grand Bay had riots. And the British had to declare martial law, you know? And they killed people. We're getting a history lesson here well, tonight. And, they people. and that is something that in the history that we learn in school, in high school, we don't learn anything about Dominican history. There is a whole wealth of Dominican history that is yet to be told and taught. For example, like most of my work, and you'll talk to me about that later, is about Kalinagos. Mm -hmm. I have actually written on the Kalinagos because I started working with them and I felt one, one way to tell their story to the world was to start writing. And that's what I, I did. In fact, my first article was written by myself and my former, my ex-wife, Dr. Tanya. <clears throat> and then I wrote more stuff later on, which we could talk about. And, and then that, it was that beginning with the indigenous people of Dominica that got me to work on the indigenous people of the world. And then we'll talk about the conflict. As well, a little later on. Yeah. But generally, uh, um, what was life like growing up in that rather intrinsic community um, that you grew up in in Grand Bay? Well, it was... As a boy growing as up. As a boy growing up. Um, it was not difficult. I, well... Unlike many other families, I, I came from a family of civil servants. My, both of my parents were civil servants. So, to an extent, I may have had some privileges that most other kids don't have. But, um, like for example, I, I started learning photography at five years. Mm -hmm. And my father was a filmmaker and a camera um, photographer. So, I was one of the few kids who had a camera then. You know? um, that was, would have probably been... That was a big age. one. Yes. Yeah. And then I remember when I was about nine, my father took me on a trip to, to Barbados, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Grenada, and Barbados. And he said I had to go to school in each one of those islands. So I did go to school and it, it really helped me to, to see where I am as a, as a, as a nine-year-old then and what were nine-year-olds learning in Barbados. And we were right on target here in Dominic. Um, then to that, I, I, I took the common entrance at 10 years old. 10 years. Yeah, and I passed and then went to high school. And I, I, 
As a 10 year old, I was the smallest kid in almost throughout high school in the class. I was really small, man. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so just that's how I started. But being small, was it to your advantage, disadvantage? Were you? It was a little bit of a disadvantage because some of the bigger guys would want to pick on me. Oh. Yeah, the, the thing is that most of the most of my colleagues, for? right? Most of my colleagues in high school were at least two or three years older. Some of them were getting onto their 13th birthday, and I was just coming in as a 10 year old. And um, <laughs> but I had to make up for it by just being smart. <laughs> <laughs> I had to read and do a lot of stuff. You know, um, I did my work. So as a, as as the, one of the smallest kids in school, uh, when you say they would pick on you, what what would be the picking? What would the picking be like? Well, well, sometimes, uh, and I used to get really irritated by that one. But guys in the back of the class would just shout my name all the time, I mean, consistently, like twenty times, and I I say, well, why are you calling me? You know, Your real name was my real name, my name, my real name, Kristen, right? <laughs> <laughs> so those things and. Um, there are a couple of kids who try to fight, and you know, that is where the Shangwambe in me comes out. You want to fight? Well, let's fight. You know, I'm a Shangwambe. <laughs> little you, really? Yeah, little me, little me. Yeah, you can ask my classmates. Yes, <laughs> I have to make up. <laughs> but what kind of, what kind of, what kind of child were you? What kind of child were you? What kind um, of student were you? I was extremely shy. I was extremely shy as a child. Um, I mean, I was. So shy that I, I wouldn't even, I found it a challenge to talk to girls to ask them for a date. <laughs> Honestly, you know? And, um, like, I remember one day in Roseau, my mother said I had to carry something. And I had to carry it on my head. And, <laughs> and I, I was really embarrassed, you know, to be walking in the city of Roseau with <laughs> somebody on my head. And I, I, my mother knew I really she knew I was embarrassed and she couldn't understand why, but it's just that I don't want my school friends seeing me <laughs> <laughs> So That's when they would pick on you for I, sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, he's just uh, just trying to have a sip of water there. We're live in the Spotlight Radio Show with Ambassador Crispin Gregoire. And as I said tonight, you know, you normally hear this man in a professional manner, you know, just talking about all those professional things, politics or whatever the case might be. But tonight we're just getting to know the person, a bit of the politics, and so we'll come in because it's part of his life. Yeah, yeah. But we just wanted to get to know um, the person. That's what the In the Spotlight Radio Show is all about. Yeah. It's all about getting to know the individual. Yeah. So we're having a few laughs with you yes, here as well, right. you know. Yeah, no, but, but I'll tell you, any student would be embarrassed with walking <laughs> Whether it be a basket, a, 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 a bag of whatever it is, yeah. I mean, really, yeah. who wants to be walking around <laughs> or so with that, mm -hmm. um, you know, on there with a, a, a bag on their head? Right. But I guess some people have to go through that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know, um, so many people, that is their way of life. And yes. That's what we carry things, you Definitely, know? definitely. And, yeah. But, but so school, the school days, um, were you bright? Were you, um, what subjects did you do? What did you like in school? Yeah. Well, the first thing I should admit is that I, I, I repeated second form. You did? Yeah, because... Unbelievable! <laughs> <laughs> and most people want to you know, what happened was my parents, were, or my father was, was going to school in England and um, uh, my mother went to join him and, I, and for the first time in my life I was, on, I was not with my parents. And um, I lived with... Uh, with uh, some relatives here in Rosa for one year. And that year I, I detested that year frankly. I, I just I think I was aimless. I was just I was ten going on eleven and um, still still not clear. And then once my mother came back, I just snapped back into what I was supposed to be doing. But I did I think I failed two classes and and then I, I cried that <laughs> that, that um, June at the SMA and then you know so I just had to face it and I said from here on, no way, it's just, I just have to finish it for But <clears throat> while I was at SMA, something very important development occurred. And that was, um, Rosie Douglas had been, in, 
um, imprisoned in Canada. He, there was this riot uh, at his university, and he was one of the leaders, and he was arrested, and he eventually went to prison. There was um, his sympathizers were largely concentrated at SMA, and SMA became a hotbed of black power. You mean students? Students, students, yes, yes. Most of the the the, the, the brothers at SMA were white brothers, and um, the lay teachers were Dominicans. There was, I remember at the time, there was one Canadian woman who was a teacher teaching sciences, and then there was a black American, African American woman who was teaching there as well. Well, you know, all, at the time you had the movement for New Dominica, and they were leading the charge for um, uh, rights of people of African descent, and they were talking about things like the banks making all the money in Dominica, and we wanted to chart a new political direction for Dominica. And eventually the movement for New Dominica became sort of left wing and was called communist and um, <clears throat> I was part of all of that. Um, when I, when, when Do you I, remember what form you were in at the Yes, time? I was in third form. Third form, yeah. a third form of Yeah, right. And you're getting all involved in that oh, form? Very, very involved, that. very involved, very involved, uh, Padina, very involved. And uh, so the, the people that I were close to were Desmond Trotter and um, Roy Mason, these two guys were actually facing um, the murder for a Canadian who was killed during that time. I think it was in 74 that happened at Carnival. And um, so that kind of tarnished the whole movement a bit. And I was the focal point for the movement for the Dominican Grand Bay. In 74. Because I, I left school. What happened, right? <laughs> what happened? You're kidding me yeah. out here. <laughs> what happened was that um, because most of the boys at SMA in, in fifth, when I got to fifth form, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in fourth form when all of this fell. And um, the brothers had to leave. They closed the school down. Right. The brothers closed the school down. And, um, and um, we didn't know whether SMA was going to open in September. Eventually, the bishop figured out something, they got Father Felix to come. And when, I, when Father Felix was the principal for the first year, I was in free form. They had a practice that if you didn't get five O levels, you could come back and double free form and, and do more O levels and get five. But Father Felix said he don't want any of these bad eggs anymore. He, all of these boys, black power boys, have to leave. And I was one of Including you. Including me. I, I only got three O levels. That, we didn't study at all. We were very involved, I mean, demonstrations. And, we had a demonstration at SME. That's what shut the school down. And we took that demonstration to CEO only blood at government headquarters. And I remember that day, clearly, the demonstration it's is leaving. Take us back, yes. The demonstration, SMA rings his bell for assembly, and all of the radicals just ignore assembly, and we walk out. And we take we, enough people to create a demonstration and take that demonstration to government headquarters. And as and for then, as we were walking down to government headquarters, I just see parents come and take their children. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm saying, I'm a big, I am behaving big because I know that day my father is in Portsmouth for work, so I don't care. <laughs> but, <laughs> so the, the brothers eventually, after that demonstration, they closed the school. And, yeah. But SME was a hotbed of radicalism mm -hmm. and, and black power ideas. Beyond the SMA though, um, yes. how far did you take this quote unquote radicalism and black power movement in terms of your life beyond uh, oh. St. Mary's Academy oh, and happened? how it impacted you? Yeah, I've taken it to many places. But um, what happened was that I now had to go to teach. When Father Felix said we cannot double free form, which is that you really shouldn't be doubling free form, but anyway, that was the situation we had. Then most of my my, cl my classmates only got free, free two. Because you were not concerned We're not about studying. School. We're not studying at all. So anyway, <laughs> I went to the Brandy School to teach for two years. I was like seventeen. So in spite of that and your involvement in this Black Power movement thing, you still got an opportunity to teach. To teach. Nobody held that against no, you. No, no, they never held that against me. And, and some of my other colleagues from Grandy were also sort of black power sympathizers. They were also teaching, but they were there a few years, a couple years before me. They were a little bit older. And um, it is while I am teaching 
in that two years that the Geneva uprising happens. There you go so again. I see it live and direct <laughs> and, and then UNICEF who's leading the charge, he's a friend of mine, right? And people now think that, well, maybe Chris Greg was the brain behind this thing because they're trying to figure out how could UNICEF lead this thing? But it was all about UNICEF. UNICEF really led this thing. And we just watched, but we were also sympathetic because we wanted land for the primary people. So after that, just before we get to 90, so 74 was the uprising, 75, from, from the time the uprising happened, we tried to figure out how do we, what do we do? And I, I felt that we could have, we had ideas about having a cooperative because Afi Martin had started a, a, a cooperative at Cassibus, so we thought we could emulate that. I went to Cassibus then to see what had happened there, to see if we could replicate it in Granville. But it was a totally different context. And now, um, the issue was that Nasif had to go, and then um, the Grand people would get the land and government sort of put in place the process. And then when this Charles government came, they continued the process, and then they eventually had the land reform, and then they distributed the land, the Grand Bay people. Right? Um, at that point, 75, I got together with a sister from Grand Bay called Noreen John, who's a lawyer in, in Roseau. And we just talking, and she said, you know, we should do something for Grand Bay because we 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 now you know 18, 19, 19 years old. And I said, yes, let's let's form a group. And we formed a group called Les Shell. And one of the people we invited to to be a member of the group was Pierre Charles. Mm. Yeah. So I was the president of the group, and Noreen was like the vice president, then. And, and then Pierre Charles was just an ordinary member. And, not an executive member. But that year, about five of the key people in that group left to go to university. Okay. Yeah. And when that, that vacuum that was left was filled by Pierre Charles, mm -hmm. he, he literally took over the leadership. It just came to him naturally, and he just he built his political career on that organization. Before we continue, yes. what was the objective of this Lechelle organization? Oh, yeah. What were you all about? Yeah. The, the, our first principle was that we wanted to take Granby to another stage, mm -hmm. another rung of the ladder. And we wanted to do things like literacy education, okay. we wanted to do farming, we wanted to do multiple things but do community service. That was the most important thing for us, to do community service. And it, had, it was a vibrant group of good, very strong people. Most of them had been to high school and, and a lot of them went on to university later on and we all wanted to help. But never in my wildest dream did I think that one of us would become a prime minister. I never had that idea in my mind. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, but but we 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 were very from the very beginning a political group, distinct from a youth group. We said we are emphatically political, and we're going to take a lot of flack for that. And we did take a lot of flack for it, but we're not going to yield. And. What was the age range? What was your age range at that time? Um, well, I was, at the time I was about going to on 18, my other colleagues were like two years older. Seriously? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. At that age, you all were so vibrant and, you know, community oriented. And, and, and also a good world view because we began to understand the world in, in, in basically two arenas. One of the, the, the developed countries and the developing countries. Mm -hmm. And we begin to be familiar with governments in other countries. So we followed the liberation movements in Southern Africa. We supported Mandela. We, we, um, we wanted um, independence for all the countries in Africa, like Angola, um, Mozambique, um, Namibia, um, South Africa, Zimbabwe. We were very much into that stuff very early. And it's because of that black power orientation, it sort of taught us more about Africa it, um, then the dread movement emerged around that time. What do you remember about that? Oh, well, that was, that was a, a seminal moment in Dominican history. Because what it really represented was a total disregard of middle class values. That these dreads were no longer going to comb their hair. <laughs> and, uh, and of course they smoked ganja. And um, so they put down middle class values. You know, they're not riding car, they're not riding, at the time, no iron, they're not, they're, they're only vegetarian food um, and fruits, 
um, no meat of the swine. Um, <laughs> just it was just like a, a revolution that had occurred in the society from the bottom, and it shook the whole country all the way to the top. So the government had to pass this law to outlaw the dreads, which wasn't a, the best thing to do. But of course, some of these dreads were doing some things. They were frightening farmers. They were doing bad things. Yeah, they were doing some things that were not palatable. So the government came down on them. So I, I left the country in 75. Um, the, the dread law had been passed in November of 74, and I left six months later. Um, it was a good moment, but I still stayed connected to Dominica, even though I went mm -hmm. to the U.S. I, I went to a school, there were, there were almost no West Indians at that school. I, had, I got friendly with African Americans and also whites, and I just, I knew that I came here to do work and I just came to do my degree. But when I was at the, the first college that I went to, I took a strong interest in journalism as a side to political science. And I, I also did some communication, so journalism work here. Yeah. We're going to take a break in a while after this yeah. that I'm going to ask you about. Then we're going to talk about your departure from Dominica. Yeah. So you just spoke about the dread, um, the dread movement and you know, you happen to mention ganja yes. in your conversation. Yeah. I, I want to get your views on this whole discussion now as it relates to the um, legalization yes. um, of, 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 of marijuana. And there's some discussions taking place even here within the local, um, the local sphere as it relates to uh, marijuana. What is your view yes. on this? Yes. And then we'll take a break. Yes. Well, um... I first got exposed to marijuana during that time too. Mm -hmm. I just finished high school and it, it was ever present in Grand Bay. I mean, <laughs> you in, Grand, get away from in it. Grand Bay they just smoke on the street. They don't care about police, you know, and the police was also weak in Grand Bay too. Well, I heard that, I heard that too, that at one time police were scared of going to yeah, Grand Bay. Yeah, right, well. exactly. And the police station has always been away from the village. So they, they don't come down to Grand Bay right at night. Right, so. They don't come down at, at night unless called. Okay. They don't patrol. So the, my view on ganja is that I always knew that ganja was a medicine, mm -hmm. a medicinal plant. And I had serious problems with sending people to jail for having a joint. Even back then, back then in 75, I always felt that there had to be a way to decriminalize. Sending people to jail just for a joint or even a seed. I, I, I know people who went to jail for having seeds. But 40 years from that time, I now realize that the world has changed because ganja is almost legal in the U.S. At least for in, medicinal purposes. Yeah, in Canada it's totally legal mm -hmm. as of now. Um, in some states of the U.S., like Oregon and Washington State and Colorado and or, um, what, um, there are a few states, I can't remember all of them, it's fully legal. Then in other states, you have medical marijuana. So the point is that I think that debate is a healthy one. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the future directions of Dominica could be medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. I think we should, that should be something we should aim for mm -hmm. because we might be left out. The Jamaicas are moving very quickly. St. Vincent is moving very quickly to get in. And we are still way behind. But what I would like to see very soon, I would like to see decriminalized. Let us remove the criminalization of marijuana so that all of these young people will, who smoke a joint will not end up losing, having a bad record with the police, police record. Um, I think that we need to decriminalize as to whether we should legalize it. That's probably another stage. Mm -hmm. I think Dominicans are conservative people. They, they, that would be a big change for Dominicans. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that I've looked at the law in Jamaica, how they've done it. And you can't smoke in public in Jamaica, even though it's decriminalized a bit. Um, and then you, you only allow to grow four trees for your personal use. And then you allow up to two ounces for personal use. I but see. if they catch you with more than that, they wouldn't. You, okay. you know. So I think that Jamaica, the approach that Jamaica has taken to it is one that we can look at, but ultimately we need to decriminalize. Okay, that is your, that would be your initial recommendation. Yes, right, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay.
We're taking a break. It's 9.59 and what a discussion it has been um, thus far. Ambassador Crispin Gregor, the other side of him, if you want to put it that way, on the In The Spotlight radio show tonight. We're coming back right after this. Thank you for tuning in and for choosing us tonight. We really do appreciate it. Good night. <laughs> I think people are loving the. the are they following it on Facebook? Yes, they are. Oh, okay. Um, and they are. I guess they can hear us. You can talk to them now if you wish. Oh, really? Because we are here. Oh. I think most importantly, they are um, enjoying uh, the the history uh, okay. that you're sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very importantly. So, guys, it's, he's on a we're on a break now. So wave at him and say hello. <laughs> Somebody says you should actually be teaching history in school. Uh, I want to. I, I, am, I, I actually teach American history. You do? And I teach in... Um, well, they want you to teach Dominican oh, history. I would, teach, I would love to. I'll do a few lectures. So you plan on going there? Yeah, I plan to go to England because I'm writing two two works, one on the Geneva Uprising and one on the Kalinagos. Okay. And I, I have to go to the British Museum too. And we are back. It's two minutes past the nine o'clock hour. Good evening to you again, wherever you are tuned in to the program. suggestions there for Mr. Gregoire uh -huh. via our Facebook live feed and thank you to those of you who are viewing, thank you to those of you who are listening and those who are also tuned in via Q95 online and those who are actually viewing via the Q95 website. Thank you for that. So I'm getting a few suggestions there for you, Mr. Sure, Gregor. One sure. that you should be teaching history uh -huh. <laughs> here in Dominica. Uh -huh. And I think some people really appreciated the bit of the history that you gave yeah. um, on Grand Bay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciated that as well because yeah. I'm just from the neighboring community, Pichle. Right. And um, I think general, generally people are just um, liking the fact that you're providing that level of information. So we're learning about you, but you're also sharing with us. And I, I said to you at the beginning of the program, if you can do that and inspire and motivate at the same time, then I think we're doing an awesome job here tonight. Yes. Um, with well, I, as we got teaching history in Dominica, I'd like to do that. In fact, what, what I want to say that I'd like to do is a series of lectures. Uh -huh. um, and maybe at, the, at UWE, at the State College, uh, fifth form of, of high school, I'd love to do that. Because one of the things that I've come to realize is that we still have not they're not teaching us Dominican history in high school. We know nothing about our, we know very little about our history. And what I have done over the last 20 years is just immerse myself in reading what a lot of other people have written about Dominica and also reading stuff from the British archives. Um, it's a tremendous learning. I think that we have to redo the curriculum, especially in, for, for, for history and social studies. We have a lot of work to do still in that. But when I think that most Dominicans don't know anything about the 1844 census riots, what is called the Lajene. I don't know about Yeah, that. right. You don't learn that in high school. 
You don't learn anything about the Kalinagos in high school. You learn that the Kalinagos were all killed by the Europeans, and that's what. So there's nothing about the Kalinagos in the history books, but they're here. The Kalinagos are here, and so I spent a lot of time working with the Kalinagos. Five years full time working with the Kalinagos, and um, I learned a lot of things about them. And I started, you know, I said, let me start writing about them. You mentioned the census riots. Yes. Tell us a little about that about for those of those who probably don't know much about that yes. before we get into right. your departure from Dominica in 1975. Yes. The census riots um, were, happened after slavery ended. Slavery, slavery was abolished in um, 1834, but the, the planters made a lot of noise and they forced the British government to agree that the slaves, the former slaves, would well they would work for four years in what was called an apprenticeship system. They would get a little pittance of a wage and that they could grow their, um, their gardens. They gave them more leeway to grow their gardens and that kind of thing. So the British government had this idea about doing a census in 1844 to know how many, how many people are in Dominica because most of them were, were former enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the enslaved Africans, they were, now they were not, no longer slaves. They said, no way, because what happened, some of the overseers who were white on some of these plantations were making threats to the, slave, the, slave, the former slaves to say that that census is to re-enslave them. And so the whole uprising, this um, Lajeneg and the, the census riots, was to stop any kind of enumeration. Right? So when, when, this, when, the, when the enumerators went to homes, People just refused to give, give the information. information. Yeah. And that, they led, that led to riots and um, there was um, looting at Geneva, there was looting all the way in Collio. The entire West Coast, Canefield was, uh, was an uprising, Point Michel was an uprising. Um, Grand Bay, I was reading a story about when the Grand Bay contingent reached Pichlin, they had over 100 people armed heading for Rose. Right, and then the British declared martial law. They sent a, a, a warship here, and they they came on shore and they they killed people. How do you know all of this? From the British documents. The British government. That's one thing about the British government. They they they, they wrote a lot of documents and the letters between the governor and, and the Home Office. I'm reading all of that stuff, and and um and the the one man who was executed. They said he fired a stone after the deputy governor and, and he, the stone hit him, but it, it didn't really kill him. They executed that man for that. And you know what they did? He was from Grand Bay, the guy who was leading this. They put his head on a, on a stake along the road from Geneva going towards Bishlane. So everybody could see this skull, right? And you know, the British were pretty brutal in their, their, their stance towards this, the slaves and then even after slavery. So, you know, they, that how it ended, there was a commission of inquiry, and you can actually read the commission of inquiry into the 1844 riots, and it gives you a lot of information. And then there are a whole set of documents in the British archives that you can't get on, online. It's not digitized yet, so you have to go to the British archives to see. But we have a lot of people who have written, sociologists and anthropologists, and um, political scientists who have written. So you have to read those people. So you, as you read, and when I read, right, when I read these works, I spend a lot of time in the footnotes. That's where I get all the information, in the footnotes. And I, for those students who are out there, read the footnotes. Very critical. Read the footnotes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, you plan going to England, you said, to yes. get some more information. Well, about well I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'll finish this work on the Geneva Uprising, uh -huh. and so there are some documents in the British Museum that I need to, for that. And the reason for that is that the, my approach to writing that book is to put Geneva in the context, not just to write about the uprising, but to write the history of Geneva, what happened from one family. And you could just take one family because Geneva was one of the first estates in Dominica. And the, the Lockhart family, they had that estate from 1822 up to 1949. Over more than 100 years, 120 years, one family, the white, white family, Lockhart, Jean Rees, you've heard of Jean That's Rees, right? right? Well, Jean Rees was a granddaughter of, she, she came from that family. 
you know. Her mother, her mother was a locket. And um, I am also learning about Geneva through reading Jean Rhys' works because she's literally writing about Dominica every time she writes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. White Side Castle Sea, her famous book, is about is about Geneva. It's called Culibri in the in that book. But here's the, here's the interesting thing. Culibri is the next estate called Bordio. Bordio, right? Mm -hmm. Grand Culibri, that the Bellas estate. She, 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 she knew that estate existed, so she calls Geneva in her book, Culibri, right? And um, she, she writes some very, you, you can learn a lot about the Geneva, read a lot. Um, the other work that I hope I could also do, I'm being ambitious here, I'd like to write something on the Caribs again, on the Calinagos, because I have done something, one was for Yui, um, it's a scholarly work, and um, I had two co-authors, Dr. Kim. Dr. Natalia Cannon, my ex-wife, and Patrick Henderson, who used to be at the Peace Corps. We wrote this part, this one for an anthology for UWE, the Institute of Social and Economic Research. And um, I think I've written one thing, one other thing, but but I hope that I could do something, some good literature that could be used by by, by students going forward. Um, that's my dream. <laughs> I think the dream is still attainable. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Just some more years. <laughs> because you know why? Because you seem so passionate about it, though. I am very, passionate. very I passionate, passionate. I think, I think those two top, those two areas, the Grand Bay Uprising, because it has that. What happened at Geneva was what the Maroons tried to do and didn't. It, they didn't succeed. But it happened after slavery, and UNICEF was able to end the plantocracy in Grand Bay. Um, with the Kalinangos, having worked with them five years, I came to understand them and accept them and embrace them. And I, I really like the Kalinago people. I've learned a lot from them. They like me. They um, would work together. Even because I'm involved in the global indigenous movement, I'm sort of connected with them and bringing them into the global movement. Um, it's good. I think the Kalinagos are well poised because of the things that happened while I was at the UN, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was passed while I was an ambassador at the UN. I was one of the people leading the charge for the world, for the, the, the draft, not the draft, but the actual um, declaration. Um, because not many ambassadors wanted to touch that, but I think it was important because we have indigenous people and we want to be sure that their rights are respected. Mm -hmm. so, um, later on, Having done that work, and then the work on the declaration, then when it comes for the World Conference of Indigenous People, who do they pick? They pick me, of all persons. And I think that was an honor for Dominica, but the current government did not see that to be an important thing. They didn't even send the Kalinagos to the conference, which was really disturbing. And um, they... This, I mean, I come from a village. I come from Granby. To be on the world stage to organize a conference, to be the top person leading the conference, organizing and making sure it goes well, um, that's, that's an honor for our country. Of course, of course. You know? But I didn't get that kind of reception. In fact, I get a very cold reception from the people at the financial center. So, In terms of, of the publications that you, 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 you dream yes. of, of completing, what would it take to get you to complete those? I have started. I have started writing, um, but some of the chapters are incomplete because the documents I still need to see. Like, for example, I'll give an example. Writing about Geneva, I find out that E.C. Lo Black, in somewhere around 1948 or 47, writes to the British government on behalf of the Grand Bay people because there's no. You know, the, he was a labor leader from Grand Bay. He's from Grand Bay, and he's leading the, the, the agriculture workers. And um, he had, he was in touch with Phyllis Shand Alfrey, and and then he, um, he he hooked up with the Fabian socialists in England, and they were pushing this thing. And those letters are actually in the British archives, but it's not online. So I would like to see the text of it, and I would like to just reproduce the text in that book. So there's that. There's um, there's a lot of stuff about the Lockhats, like for example, I give something that I picked up. I read in the, about the Lockhats just two weeks ago. James Porter Lockhart was the first Lockhart who came here. He's the one who bought Geneva. Geneva wasn't one piece of land. There were different estates. There was Hagley, was an estate. 
Douglas Hall was another estate. There are a whole set of other names. Lockhart eventually bought all these different pieces and made it one. So it, it became 1,233 acres, Geneva, right? But Lockhart, in his will, he, he apparently, I don't know how to say this, but he had, a, he had one of the slave women who was a mistress. And when he died, he actually, he, he didn't give her freedom completely, but he left her a piece of land that she could work. And it's in the wheel. I found that rather interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah. so, so there's a lot of stuff. And then the letters between Lockett and, and his wife and Lockett and his brokers in England, a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Maybe. I hope you get to all of that <laughs> yeah. at, at, at some point. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go back now to um, Crispin Gregoire, the young man um, in Dominica, having <laughs> been attracted to uh, some level of radicalism. Um, the Black Power Movement is involved in the formation of a group, Le Shell, um, very community oriented, very young age, and a, a, a group of like minded individuals from the community coming together, focused on their community, and all of that. But at some point, you decided that you had to, to move on. But before that, you did a few local jobs. Yes, um, I, 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 talked with, for, I talked for two years. You talked for two school. years, uh huh. Yeah, and um, after that, I, when I left, after two years, then mm -hmm. I, I went. I went to a college in, in, in Virginia. Okay, how did that happen? It's a very interesting thing, quite coincidental, because the and that 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 move into the U.S. has impacted my life up to this point. But let me just tell you what it. My my father had a, a friend in the U.S. who was into film and um, he came to Dominica a few times and, and um, my father said he wants to send me to college and so on. So he, he said, one time he said, well, Crispin could live with us, right? Yeah, and um, it was, it's a white family. So he went to the U.S. in Virginia to live with a white family and um, I did. And so... <laughs> what did you think about that in the first place? I must ask. Yeah, well... I didn't know what to expect. I know I was going to the U.S. I got my visa and all of that, and <laughs> but thinking about how would I settle in a house all white, and <laughs> and then um, how would I relate to the the children and their friends, and I, it was a, quite a learning experience. For example, I give you this example: the white kids don't like black music. Mm. I I like black music. I'm buying my records. I'm buying Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> they, they will never play those, those records. <laughs> but because I was West Indian and I spoke different from African American, they sort of warmed up to me, okay. right? And then once I got into college, I was in the political club. I was in. Of course um, you were. I was a journalist. Of course I was, you were. I was writing. I was the news editor for the school newspaper. I started writing. Journal I started writing about Bob Marley and reggae, and nobody had heard of Bob Marley in '76, '75. So, Bob Marley came to Georgetown University, which is not far away from where I was, and I said, I must go to see Bob Marley. <laughs> I saw him in 76, and that was a highlight, because, you know, to have seen Bob Marley in my lifetime and to see him live was an important thing for me, and then I started writing, I wrote about Bob Marley, and, and um, one of the things that was an adjustment is that, you know, here we learn British spelling. When you go to America, you know, have to adjust that English spelling. So it's still English, but my, my English teacher would always write British spelling, you know, words like color. And, <laughs> and eventually I lost the British spelling. <laughs> I just had to get rid of it. Um, so I spent two years in, in Virginia, but I got an associate degree, and then I applied to Columbia. And most people say, Are you crazy? You're coming from a community college and you want to go to a top school? I said, Yeah, I'm applying. And I applied and Columbia accepted me. I went to Columbia in New York, one of the top schools in, you know, in the US. And, and what happened there is a defining moment because the black power comes back. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get to Columbia in, in, in the fall of um, 77 and, and then um, I met some radical students. They had blocked Henry Kissinger's job at the, at the university. So I now joined them. And they say, well, 
they want to work on another issue, but they don't know what. So I said, well, why don't you work on a path line? <laughs> so they said, yes. So I jump on that, and next thing, I end up being the president of the anti apartheid movement at Columbia, white school. The university had about 80 million invested in South Africa. So we know after that 80 million has to be divested from, from the banks that the university has those stocks and the companies that... And the, we forced the university to, to sell out from those companies that were doing business in South Africa. So what happened on May 1st, 1978, I called a big demonstration. And we had about you something else. Yeah, we had about two thousand students. I brought drummers. I brought drummers on, on on the campus, and then and then when I saw the thing was really lively, I said, you know what? We're gonna take this demonstration into the street. So we left the university gates and we blocked traffic for hours. <laughs> And what frightened me the next day is the you were frightened? I was very frightened because the newspaper in New York, the New York Newsday, which is the largest newspaper in the city, not, not the New York Times, they wrote a front page story, um, West Indian student leads big demonstration at Columbia and they put my whole profile. I was 21 at the time and um, I went into my shell. I was so scared that they're going to deport me. <laughs> So the university, um, I, was, I, had, I was graduating the next year, so I, I said, well, if they want to deport me, I'll go back to Dominica. I have my degree. <laughs> so I studied political science. I, I, did a, I, I specialized in international politics. And once I got my degree, I wanted to stay to Colombia to do um, masters, and they, they wouldn't give me any financial aid. So I just kissed of them. Not. I just kissed them off. <laughs> And I went to Howard University in Washington and did my master's there. <laughs> so, I hope there were no more black yeah, uh, uh, after yeah. that. Well, after I left, st new students continued the movement. And there were, there were riots there later on. I wasn't there then. So, so that was um, that. Then I went to Howard. Before you continue, yeah. before going to Howard, yeah. a, a, a viewer is asking a question. Yeah. The person says to me, for Dinah, Please ask him how could he have been so active in Black Panther, Black Power movement, and be comfortable with the term African American. It's interesting. Well, when I went when I went to the U.S., they were talk the, the word African American had not yet become a term. Uh -huh. It was it was Black Americans. They had some other thing, you know. but eventually African American evolved, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that it was a natural progression because Afri African People of African descent in the U.S., you know, they they are very much like us because they 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 are descendants of, of slaves, but they had a different type of slavery and they had a longer slavery. Their slavery didn't end until 1865. We were free in 1828. So we we are not timid people. I mean, if you if your ancestry is slavery, then you cannot be timid. You know, you have to be. Forthright, you have to be strong and you have to work hard and you have to embrace education as the, the only thing that will get you a different life. Go, you know, so when you are in your 20s, you need to study and learn and get some skills. that will, this, I call them lifelong skills. I, I'm an adult educator, so I, I focus on how to keep adults learning throughout their lives. That's what I, I, I focus on. Although... I haven't done a lot of work in that area because I went into political science and I, I, I did different things. But um, for, for all intents and purposes, I'm a good teacher. I teach. I like to teach things about political science, philosophy, community development. Um, I, I like journalism. I also teach. I can teach journalism. Um, but after I did a... a, a Doc, uh, master's work in adult education and economics, I decided I, I need to go to Dominica now mm -hmm. to apply what I had learned. And I, I was, when I came back, I was 27, and I, I, I came back under good circumstances because the Save the Children US was looking for a Dominican director, and they hired me from Connecticut. And um, I, it was a very interesting time working in the, in the 80s. I came in 84, I was still till 89. And um, basically, you know, you see again, 
part of the principle of black power is that you get educated so you can contribute to the larger good of Dominica. That was what we were thinking. And most of my friends, we were thinking, we'll go back to Dominica after, after university. And some of us did, some of us didn't, didn't, but we... I would love to teach history in Dominican, sure. <laughs> the real Dominican history. The real Dominican history. Yeah, because, you know, we... have quite a grasp of it, too. Yeah, we... I mean, we have some people who have written excellent works on our history, but I still think that it's still evolving because our history has to be told by us, who were the descendants of those slaves. We have a different story than the, the Europeans. So... I, I, I embrace everybody who writes about us, but they might not always tell you the true story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, Howard University, you yeah. focused on adult education? And, and economics. In, yeah. in, uh, that, that, that was your master's? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, after that, is that when you came back That's to right. Dominica? Yeah, soon after I finished that master's degree, I came back. Yeah. You came back, yeah. and you, you came back to Dominica to, to work with Save the Children? Yes. And you That's the U.S. Save the Children. U.S. Save the Children. That was Canadian as well. So, what did, you, what did that entail? What did you do um, here? Yeah. Well, when I, when I arrived, I, well, before I arrived, they told me that most of the focus of the program was with the Carnagos. Mm -hmm. And they asked me whether I would be comfortable working with the Carnagos. And I said, absolutely. You know, I, I don't see any reason why I would not have worked with them well. And, um, but the Carnagos, if you know the history of the Carnagos and the African black, black Dominicans, African Dominicans, it hasn't been a very rosy picture. There have been a lot of rivalry between the Black, black men in particular and, and Kalinago men and it's because part of it is about women because black men like Kalinago women and the Kalinago resent that that's historically the case I mean you go back the last hundred years um, so when I, when I first came to Kalinago I, the word got around Mrs. Onegusa he's a black person right? so they, they, they were skeptical as to whether I could appreciate them for who they are and whether I could work with them. In a very short time, they saw that I was a person who could work with them. Mm -hmm. And up to this day, I have an excellent relationship with the Carolina. All of them, all the chiefs, all the counselors, the, the children in the schools. So here's what we did. Um, so, support to all the Carolina schools. Or, um, we built a cabe, a longhouse. I was the one who... Oh, my, my predecessor was the one who designed it. I was the one who implemented the project and built it. Um, I built a library in Concord. Um, I was um, doing water projects because when I went to Kalinago territory, there, were, there was no running water. And by law, we, we as Save the Children were not allowed to do water projects, but Ms. Charles said that we could do small community water systems. So I built in every hamlet in, in Kalinago territory, I built water system. Sometimes I built a tank that would hold like um, 2,000 gallons of water and so I was doing water projects. Even one of my projects is still there, um, the Concord Water Project, which eventually the Wasco took on, um, is still the, the water system for Concord. Um, I also built the Jolly John Park in, in, in Carnago. In Marigot, I had a lot of um, enterprise projects, you know, Marigot people, there are a lot of business type people in Marigot, so we give them assistance to get started. There was a place called the Youth Center where they had different businesses located. Um, I, then I started, I got permission to expand into the Granby district. But what happened after Ms. Charles said we could work in Granby, then as soon as she won the election in 85 and Pierre Charles won the election in 85, Ms. Charles called me, they called me to a cabinet meeting and said, we don't want you working in Granby at all, at all, at all. Why? I said, why? They said, well, we don't want you to help pay charge. So then I, then I said, well, can I work in PD7? And they said, yes, I can work in PD7. So I went to work in PD7. And the long and short of it is that through that work, the people voted against Stanley Fidel and they elected Barra. So, so, <laughs> I was very, so Ms. Charles decided that she, in 89, she's going to end this. And she closed the children. She closed the children. Yeah, we, we, yeah. Because of politics. Yeah, and I had to, and I left. And it was at that point that I left um, Dominica and um, you went back to the US. I went back to the US. I spent three years in the US, in New York, um, and then 
Are you a U.S. citizen? Yes, I am. Yes, I, be, I became a naturalized U.S. citizen. Naturalized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, my wife and I, we got jobs in Nigeria, and we, we just moved. You moved to Nigeria. I moved to Nigeria. You and your wife. And my wife and my, and my son. I had a son. Uh, he probably was about eight years old, and we moved to Nigeria. I spent six years there, and um, it was really a wonderful experience because it now exposed me to the whole continent. So I started traveling on the continent. I've been to half of Africa. It's a huge continent. I mean, imagine for that it, it takes ten hours to fly from Egypt to South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's how big the continent is to go from north to south. And I was living in West Africa, so I traveled a lot in West, and then eventually to East Africa. And I started working in, all, in many African countries, and one of my best projects was I was uh, an advisor to the film festival in Zanzibar, which is in Tanzania. Zanzibar. Zanzibar. It's an island. It's bigger than Dominica. It's about almost three times the size of Dominica. And they grow a lot of spices there. So this film festival, and I working with them and advising them, and they said that their goal is to become the second largest film festival in Africa. And do you know that they are there now? They actually are the second largest film festival, and I get yeah, they yeah. got they got to that yeah, and I'm actually a goodwill ambassador for the festival. So every year they invite me. I've been twice, but can't always go. And so, but I must say that that experience working in Africa over this period of over ten years has really helped me to understand the African, understand the state of technology in Africa, understand the resources because incredibly rich continent. And, um, it, and here's what it did for me too. It helped me understand the African in us. Because when I went to Nigeria, I know I'm eating tonton pile, I'm, I am eating um, uh, cassava, because they eat cassava, more cassava than we do. Um, and I started working with farmer groups. I was working with one farmer group that had 500,000 members, more than, far more than the population of Dominica. Wow. That's one group has half a million members. And I'm giving them grants. I was working for the Ford Foundation then. I, gave, I was a grant maker, um, giving, giving funding away. And um, after it came to an end, I went back to the US. I had now done six years in Nigeria. So by 1998, I come back to the US. I, I, I want to talk, pause a bit. Yeah. I want to talk about the culture yeah. of, of Nigeria. So you talk about the totopili, right. which is similar to what we eat, the cassava. Right. What is the life like, okay. um, you know, living? What is living like in yeah. Nigeria? Yeah. Well, it's an incredibly huge country. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is one million square miles. So one million yeah, square miles. Right, so that tells you how big it is. Um, so there are different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. There are parts of the country that you can see is the culture is closer to us. Mm -hmm. Like for example, you go to the eastern part of Nigeria, you'll see the sensei costume in in um, in um, uh, trees or well, leaves, and mm -hmm. you know um, the same mask, same type of mask. Um, then the drumming. Different parts of the country have different drumming, and of course the country is, is, the northern part is mostly Muslim, half of the country is Muslim, the other part is Christian, southern part. It's an incredible country that has advanced society, like almost like cities like the US and England. That is how advanced it is. And then you have a lot of universities, and the way the women dress, they always wear their head tied, they always wear their, their Nigerian clothes. All, you know, all the time, and um, it's a place where religion is is big. Nigerians are really believe in God, and um, and then the other half that's that's the Christians, that the, the Muslims um, uh, believe in Islam, and um, they don't always agree. The one thing that was striking to me about Nigeria, there's the country Nigeria, but when you enter that country. It's all divided into tribal. Okay. So you have the three dominant tribes, the Igbos in the east. Um, a lot of the people in Grand Bay, their their Igbo roots, even some of the name, like a name like Ako, that's an Igbo name, you know. Um, and then you have the Yorubas and you have the Hausas. These are the three dominant tribes. But Nigeria has two hundred different ethnic groups. There are two hundred languages, you know. There are two hundred different tribes, and what unites them is English language. You know, not everybody speaks English. And, um, and not everybody uh, goes to school because even they have in the northern part, in the Muslim part, some of the Muslims don't like girls to go to school. 
you know, so there, there's those tension, and there's a civil war going on there right now, being going on a group, group called Boko Haram. Yes, but, Boko Haram, but weren't they the ones who took the, the girls? The girls? Right, yeah, right, mm -hmm. the Shiba girls, right. Okay. Um, but I also got a chance to look at other countries. I spent time in Senegal, I spent time in Gambia, and um, a good amount of time in Kenya, and then Tanzania as well. Oh, I envy yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to travel anymore because I, you know, I've been to about a hundred and something countries, and um, I'm too tired to travel. <laughs> You're too tired to travel. No, we want you to focus now on your publications. Yes, right. That's what we you yeah. really need to focus on. Yeah. So you did enjoy your stint um, 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 on the continent. Oh yes, yeah. I, I I love the continent a lot. I haven't been there in, um, since 2007 because I. I in the last few years, most of my travel has been to Asia. Okay. Um, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to um, China. You're a very well-traveled man. <laughs> I try to. <laughs> Not anymore. These long flights are killing me. Uh, you almost want to say fly and I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm 61, you know. I, I think about my life. I mean, um, I'm now 61 and anytime you, you make free score, you get to 60. That's a, a, a milepost, an important milepost. Um, Many things have happened in that time, um, important things like Geneva, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you don't see a Geneva in your lifetime, you know, um, it's not many people who had that experience. Um, then I come back to the US mm -hmm. in 1998 and um, I got a job very quickly as I came back and it, it now allowed me to go back to Africa every, every two <laughs> or three months, you know, I was going you know, to South Africa to do lectures, I was going to... Uh, I've been to Swaziland, I've been to Botswana and Zimbabwe and oh my. so um, I, I, when I go I teach, I don't, you know, I yes. don't just visit, I, yes. I do lectures in, in how to run a non-profit, a non-governmental non, non organization. And um, what happened in 2000, I, I had this job in Washington, I came here because I wanted to be in Dominica for the new millennium. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't believe for that. I didn't know what my destiny was, but when I came, the, the next day, I arrived that, that night and I slept maybe till midday. I was so tired. I was coming from, from, I was coming from South Africa. And I, so when I got up, my mother told me that elections had been uh, announced. And um, she said, you know, your, the phone has been ringing nonstop for you. And um, I said, well, what's going on? Well, Rosie Douglas and Pierre Charles were trying to get me to come to a meeting about their, their, their campaign. Uh -huh. So I was, Mr. Black Panther and Mr. Lechel. Right, 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 exactly, right. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, I'll go. And do you know that when I went to the meeting, they had already anointed me as the campaign manager. And I said, you know, but I'm only here for two weeks and the campaign is four weeks. They said, well, we'll take whatever time you can give us. <laughs> Little did I know that once I said yes, I was stopped. Of course you were, And, and I could not see, I could not see that that election, that this thing could, could actually bring a new government. So there's a lady, there's a lady who was working at Witch Church. So I went to, at the travel agent. So I went to get my ticket because I know past the date and I have to buy the ticket. So she said, she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to New York. I'm going to Washington for a few days to come back. She said, no. Nah. She said, you, you don't know, Labour's going to win that election, and if you leave now, it might not be a good thing. I, I thought about that for a day, and then I, I, I just continued running the thing with Afi Mate, who was the, the co-manager of the campaign, mm -hmm. and the two of us, we worked very well together, and frankly, I didn't think Labour Party could win. No? I mean, actually, I, frankly, you know, it's, um, I think UWP was disorganized for that election because they, they had never seen an election from power you know when they won in 95 they're going for re-election and they didn't really know how to my view right they didn't know how to make best use of being in power because you shouldn't lose an election like that having been and the UWP had done some good things you know good projects schools they built a school in, they have done that yeah one in grand one in cash right yeah that yeah <laughs> Um, and I actually, having been a campaign manager, I had to demystify that whole you know, two, party party, two party, right? Because we want to turn it around <laughs> into its opposite. So, anyway, the night of the election, I didn't think Labour could win. And when they told me, there's Carnival in Rosa, I was, 
I, I was up at mapping, waiting to be interviewed, and it didn't happen. And I, I, when I went down to Rosa, I said, let's carry on. They said, but what is the result? Well, Labour got 10 seats, and um, UWP got 9, and then Freedom got 2. What, what a result. I just could not. I mean, it's a result where either um, the Freedom Party could have made an alliance with either the Labour Party or the UWP. I think, and I'm saying that for the first time, I think that the Freedom Party would have gotten a better deal with UWP than they got with Labour. Let, let me explain that. You know, I was in the negotiations for the new government, the, the coalition government. <laughs> and um, I know that if I am leading a party and I'm going into a coalition, well, the, other, the main party will get the prime minister, but I have to be either foreign minister or finance minister. Freedom Party didn't get that. And it's because they didn't insist. I, if I was Charles Savary at the time, I would have demanded the foreign affairs. He wanted it. But we said no. But you were not in a place to say no. I know, but we were. We, we, <laughs> the thing is that I think you had nine seats, yes. Right, we had, you needed those we two seats. We needed those two seats. seats. And, and, you know, that's why I'm I saying. I would have gotten exactly oh, yeah. what that's, I wanted. That's why I'm saying that the Freedom Party could have gotten a better deal with things. Because I think Charles Savary would have gotten foreign affairs if he had. Demanding. Yeah. You know, you know the mistake they made, the Freedom Party made? They didn't explore both avenues of whether it's labor or freedom to ally with. Ms. Charles was very emphatic that they should not talk to the UWP. And I think that was an error. They should have talked. And they would know what was possible from the from UWP because they could have. But um, it's all history. <laughs> it's all history. It is indeed all. Or history. So you played a role in all of this. Yes, I did. I did. I, I, um, I mean, I, I, the role we played, that Afi and I played, we shaped the political agenda for the elections. Mm -hmm. We we organized all the meetings. We were on all the talk shows. We were not candidates. We just run because the Labour Party was weak. Rosie Douglas was strong. Ketchup was strong. But organizationally, they had been beaten for 20 years in opposition. And now, you know, this was, this was a do or die moment, and they still didn't get the majority. Um, it, was, it was challenging. And here's the other thing they had no money. No money. Yeah, because Afi and I had to actually go on the ground in Roseau and raise money. We raised $150,000 in a month. Because we had, we had no money. They no. were broke. They were totally broke. And everybody thought that Rosie Douglas, with all these international connections, would have gotten money. He could not deliver, not a penny. Not a penny. And, um, but he made it. I mean, I, I just, it's all the new tenants. Mm -hmm. It's all of the black power people mm -hmm. from back then. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about 30 years of people who've been involved and who've been supporting. And um, this was the moment, and it was a do or die thing. And the interesting thing about the UWP and Labour Party, those two parties in particular, they, after the Alliance Party, the, the movement for New Dominica, um, for the Dominica Liberation Movement, it was called at the time, broke up. The, the, the members of those parties found themselves in either UWP or Labour. But now what, you have, what has happened 20, almost 20 years after, these people who came from the Black Power Movement and from the left wing um, were kicked out from the Labour Party by this current Labour Party. They kicked us out. So we are floating. Last election, many of us supported the UWP. But I think that the majority of these people are no longer laborers. They left, or they, they were kicked out. Yeah. And, and, and that will have an impact on what result we get in this next election, and what kind of stability, political stability we'll have in Dominica. I think Dominica is somewhat unstable right now, not because of Maria. It's because we've had a a government that's not accountable. This government has serious accountability problems. And um, I really think that we need a new dispensation in Dominica because after 20 years, when you look back, it's not a lot that the Labour Party has done. They've done some things, yes, but they have not fundamentally changed the, the economic, social dimension of Dominica. In fact, it, it has declined. Um, when we were running in 2000, here were the things that we wanted to do for Dominica. We wanted to get Dominica off oil for electricity. This has taken them almost 20 years. They can't 
get a oil for electricity. Water, we're going to make water an industry. That has not happened. We're going to make culture an industry. That has not happened. Um, we would make, we'll be a major trading partner of the smaller islands like Anguilla and the BVIs and um, even the Virgin Islands, the US Virgin Islands and, and Antigua and St. Kitts. We would be a breadbasket for them. We've declined, you know, our agriculture has really gone back, backwards, but fundamentally Dominica cannot but become an agricultural country. That is, that is our raison d'etre. We cannot not be an agricultural country. So to allow agriculture to collapse, to me, is really unconscionable. And I, I think that there are ways to modernize agriculture, there are ways to make agriculture better, and the fiasco that happened after the World Bank gave them $18 million should not have happened. I think that, to me, it's, it's fairly simple what you do with agriculture. You invest in 2,000 farmers intensively with all the inputs. When I say inputs, not a lot of fertilizer, not an and, end and round up and gromoxone zone being used for agriculture. Get out of that. Let us, make, let us make the rural people produce. And the job of government is to go and find markets for them so they can keep expanding the production. And so therefore, I am really disappointed where we are as far as agricultural production is concerned. And I'm really not happy that we've not sold one gallon of water outside Dominica. I'm talking about all this water that goes to the sea. We have fresh water. Do you know that only 3% of, of water on earth is fresh water? We are in that 3% but we're not making any money. There's no reason why our water should not be in bottles and also in bulk shipments. So I can see water industry. And I am hoping that we will get off oil for electricity. The technology to do that exists. I mean, solar is now cheap. We're working on geothermal, but that has taken, what, 16 years. And we still don't have a plant. So that is what I think. So after this 2005 yes. Yes. Um, elections, Crispin Gregoire is on the ground along with Afi Mate and... That was in 2000. In 2000, sorry. Yeah. And I, I, Afi Mate, I think, is one similar to you who might need to get on this program sometime <laughs> soon. Yes. Um, because I, I like what happened here tonight yes. in terms of the, the, the information that you're sharing with us, the yes. history. Yes. I really, really en enjoy this as, as just a host. Yes. And I'm sure the listeners are as well. I, the hope, viewers. I hope so. I, I am. I am. Seriously. So, after all of this is said and done, um, you help negotiate, you help um, get the two uh, Freedom Party seats. Um, to yeah. the Labour Party right. and the government is formed. Yeah. What happens to Crispin Gregoire after that? Well, I, I went back to Washington to my job. So you left? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> but but when I went, well, no, I didn't. I left, but not not to distance myself. Mm -hmm. We had a problem, and that was Dominica was blacklisted because of the offshore banks, and um, the, the the U.S. Treasury had put us on a blacklist, and the OECD countries, that's the European countries for the most part had also put a, 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 a blacklist on us. So, Pierre Charles said to me, Crispin, since you're in Washington, can you do some work to help us get off the blacklist? Mm -hmm. And I, I went up to Capitol Hill um, in Washington and I met some people, they, they chair, they, they, there's a committee on, on investigation because this money laundering stuff was on an investigation. So, the, one of the key staff of the, of the senator, she, she she got friendly with me and she gave me information and she mm -hmm. said, well, this is what you all need to do. But one of, the reason, one of the outcomes is that you're going to have to close these offshore banks that are involved in money laundering, which is most of them, almost all of them. So when I told Pierre Charles that, he said, well, the first priority is to get off the blacklist. So whatever it will take to do that, he'll do it. And he did. And he made, there were some people who were upset with him for that, but it was the right course of action. Otherwise, the country would, would not get loans, you know. Um, so Pierre Charles made this, he had decisions. And I also attended the IMF meetings with Pierre Charles. So I, I am very familiar with the discussion that was going on. I, I had a lot of love for Pierre Charles. I, mean, I think he was a good man. Pierre Charles was a good, he was a dynamic man. Um, he, he, 
he, he stayed back to build the party. A lot of guys went to school to get their degrees. Pietras could have done that, but he didn't. He stayed, he stayed back to build the, the party. And, um, and he came into power at a difficult time, and, but he, he, he tried his best and he, he, didn't, he died in office and, you know, um, but it was, it was the end of an era for me because I had been involved with Pierre Charles from, from the age of nine. We were in the same, we were going to school together. We sat the common entrance together, but he was like two years older than me. And, um, and I passed and he got a bursary. We went to high school the same year. He was smarter than you, man, Crispy. Oh, yeah, he was, he, he was, he was definitely smarter than me. True. He was definitely smarter than me. Because, but I know, imagine, Pierre Charles, right? Yes. When he went to high school, he became a cadet. Uh -huh. He was a scout leader. He was um, involved in the, in the choir. He was, a, he was probably an, uh, an acolyte. And then he was in a group called La Genetoire, mm -hmm. right? These were. Well, right that people. was a folk group. Like, that was a folk yes, group, yeah. like, like the Cicero. Mm -hmm. um, was it Cicero? Um, the other, there was a previous group, mm -hmm. a chorale, mm -hmm. like, uh, whatever chorale. Uh, it's not coming to me either, yeah, but right. somebody will tell us yeah. something. You know. Right. So um, I, I had a lot of love for Pierre, and whatever he asked me to do, I would, I would think seriously about it. So when he said to me in 2002 that the ambassador in New York was retiring at the UN and he wanted me to take that job, and I said no. I, I said, you know, Pierre, yeah, I have a job in Washington. He said, no, I want you at the UN. And I'm not going to take no for an answer from, me, from you. He was very emphatic. He said, I'm not taking no for an answer from you. You are the one who got me involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you better. so I took, I decided, I took the job. I, I went. And I'll tell you, for Diana, this was a defining part of my career, going to the UN. Because I had studied international relations, and now to actually be involved in day to day, and, and seeing how the theory connects, you know, um, was 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 a great experience. I met a lot of people from all over the world, and and start to push Dominica because Dominica never had a full time ambassador. I was the first one, and and every ambassador does a contribution. I have been dismayed by things that have been said by. Current ambassadors have said current ambassadors have said some really negative things about me, um, not based on any um, objective reality, but they they want they they into propaganda and cheap politics. I'm not into that. I will if I will criticize a government. I don't care who the prime minister is, if it's constructive criticism. But is that what you do, constructive? I try my best to be constructive, um, and um, you know I I fell out with the current. Prime Minister. I should talk about that because um, after Pierre Charles died, everybody expected that I would run for Pierre Charles' seat. And I, I wasn't quite ready the first, just months after. And then I had gotten married again in 2002, so I said, you know, I need some time. Then I made up my mind I'm going to run in 2009. Well, were you going to give up your seat? Yes, I was going to give it up. Mm -hmm. And, and it, was, it wasn't something that was an issue because giving it up, you know, when you're married, you can afford to take that kind of risk because your wife has citizenship. So if you give it up, if you need it back, your wife would be your, your passport to that. Mm -hmm. you, so you'd be able to get it back? Yeah. You would, well, you would, you would not get the citizenship back. You'd get permanent residence back and then you have to work up three years after you can now apply for citizenship. Okay, so you had no issue. Really. It was not an issue, but those guys in the Labour Party, this, they never thought I would give it up. They never for one minute, but, but the Prime Minister would never warmed up to the idea that Crispin Gregg was going to be elected in Granby. That's, uh, you know, if you, if you think about seriously, with my black power background and all of that, if I, if I become the elected representative for Granby, I will be an uh, elected representative for Granby, and I'll stand for Granby. And when I look at what Grand Bay has received in 20, 18 years, it's not much to talk about. You know, it's really a disaster as far as I'm concerned. And we need a, we, even in the Labour government, they should have done much more for Grand Bay. And Grand Bay has not much to show for 18 years. Okay. So I came down to run for, and the Prime Minister um, decides that he's going to hold this um, American citizenship against me and say that 
oh, it's too late to renounce your citizenship, which is rubbish, because if you want to renounce your citizenship, you just go to the embassy of the country that you have citizenship for and tell them that you want to take an oath to renounce it, and they do it right there. So I, I couldn't understand his reasoning. So eventually he called a meeting, and at that meeting he said that he is totally uncomfortable with my candidacy, and he could not support me. And um, that was it. And that was it. But were you, were you interested in running? Oh, absolutely. I came to run. You came to yeah, run? Yeah, I came down. And within a matter of about four days, my candidacy just collapsed. Oh. Yeah. And I went back to the U.S. I was still the ambassador. So I went, I completed the year. And then in January, in February, I got a call from the PS saying that um, they were going to replace me. And I said to them, but my contract says that for early termination, you need to give me three, three months notice in writing. They gave me two weeks, right? So, and then for Dinah, they, they, they took like three years to pay me for, for leave that I had accumulated. I had like over 100 days of leave. They took three years to pay. And then gratuities that they owed me from the first country, they wouldn't pay. And they didn't, the issue of breach of contract, they wouldn't even discuss. I would have to take them to court. So I just, I wrestled a bit for a number of years and I said, you know what, I'm not taking them to court. Let them enjoy the money they owe me, and, but that's not going to stop me. You still never got the money? No. They didn't, yeah, they still owe. They never paid for breach of contract. They never paid one gratuity. And the Prime Minister never talked to me. He never called me to say, well, Crispin, I'm making a change, which is normal. When you're a diplomat, know that they can change you tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. But tell, give me notice. So he, he, he didn't have the courtesy to even call me and thank me for working so hard for Dominica. And he has never talked to me. In fact, I have not seen Roosevelt Scary since 2009. Well, face to face. I have seen him in a gathering, like when John Fabian died. He was at the funeral, but he, he, he stood away from everybody else. So I've never seen the guy. I'm not looking for him either. And... Um, the point is that I'm just concerned that where Dominica is going, um, we have some real concerns. And I think, I hope all people make the right decision, but this government, to me, they have reached the end of the rope. And I don't even know what they will be running on another term for. I really don't know, but that, they, they, that's their plan. All right. If we can, we'll take a few calls for... Ambassador Crispin Gregoire. The number is 449-3095, The overseas line is 305-432-9624. This is the In the Spotlight radio show and it is quite a program. It has been with Ambassador Crispin Gregoire thus far. Quite a bit of history, kind of bit, quite a bit of information sharing, and uh, quite a few persons are viewing and listening to the program as well. So while we await your phone calls, four four nine three zero nine five nine six nine seven, the overseas line three zero five four three two nine six uh, two. Before we will uh, just talk to Crispin a bit about his overall experience as an ambassador at the United Nations for Dominica. Yes. Well, it was, uh, first of all, I, I was tremendously honored to be picked for that role. And um, both Pierre Charles and, and to the extent um, Roosevelt Skerritt, um, Prime Minister Skerritt, um, had me continue after Pechas died. That's good. Uh, as I said, I was the first full-time ambassador. You know, before, before 2002, all the ambassadors who served Dominica at the UN were part-time. Um, ambassador um, Frank Barron was the ambassador. He was, he was um, ambassador to, to the US. He was ambassador to the, to the UN. And um, after him was a man called Simon Richards who was working part-time, he was a lawyer, but he, he found time to do this work. But it's not a work that you can do part-time, it's a full-time work. So when I went to the UN, 
the, the, the first thing that you learn is that Dominica is part of a group called CARICOM. Mm -hmm. and, and CARICOM engages, that is how we engage at UN, as CARICOM. So we're part of CARICOM, we make joint statements, CARICOM makes joint statements, and so on. Um, it was a lot of learning, um, because now you have to get into the practice of diplomacy. and um, It was a really gratifying experience. I learned a lot of things. I, you know what I learned for Diana, which is very important? I learned to listen to other people's views that were different than mine. And so, like for example, I could, I could appreciate the position of the State of Israel as much as I don't like Israel's policy. But I could appreciate that the ambassador is just a servant yes. of the government and he doesn't make policy. Yes. You know? so, so that I can talk to any ambassador and try to be friendly with them and sometimes we, we meet on specific matters relating to Dominica and their country and all of that. And when I was there, I, I helped to get a number of agreements for Dominica to get help. Like for example, the geothermal program here. The first set of money is the first 6 million euros that was raised was by myself. You never hear them talk about that. You will never hear Ambassador Vince Henderson, who claims to be the guru of Geoferma, mention that Chris Greco had any role. I've heard him on radio say that the only person who had a role was um, Eddie Lambert. I, well, he's totally mistaken. It was that while I was at the UN, I met people from France who agreed to fund this thing. Okay, let us take some calls. Yes, can we, can yes. We take absolutely. Some calls? We absolutely. have some calls coming in. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Good, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh, I know you, but I know you don't know about the people because you went to school in front of the I don't know if you got from Salisbury? You're from Salisbury? Oh, that's my that's my second village. I grew up in Salisbury. <laughs> Salisbury? Yes. Uh, I didn't expect nothing less from you because I know your father was a very smart headmaster, Mr. Gregoire. Yes. So um, I'm just saying, I just say let me call you to remind you that the best School masters we have, eight masters we have, with Mr. Gregor and we shall do it not for themselves in Solvay. Uh-huh. So I remember you are part of Solvay. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much for, for saying that because Salisbury, Salisbury is like my second home and it's a village that I have tremendous admiration for, for Diana because when I went to Salisbury to live in 1960, my father was the principal for a year or two and I spent a year there and Salisbury still had thatch houses, thatch roof. Now today Salisbury is a very prosperous place. Oh, I'm just so impressed with the Salisbury people. And to have been to have grown up there, that time Grand Savannah used to go tie goats there because there was there were no houses in Grand Savannah. It was all Savannah. Owned by Sharing for I think. And um, I I really loved it and uh, the school and the church down down there and uh, I, I'll forever always Remember my days in Salisbury. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, Ambassador Greg. Yes, good evening, sir. So I heard on the program as much as one a couple of days ago. Yes. You indicated that um, you would never, or you would not contest the election in Grandi. Yes. Because you would not win. The Grandi would vote, you know, the other way. Yes. For the Liberal Party. Right. And I find it very strange because you have done so much for branding. Yes. Compared to what is being done by current power. Yes. And I'm wondering, but can you tell us exactly, in as much as you have done so much for branding, why is it that the people from branding wouldn't consider you yes. over anyone else, including the current power? Yes, okay, that's a, good, right, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the thing is that I'm not sure whether the Grand people wouldn't vote for me. I, what I do know, I'm, I'm sort of a realist, and what I do know is that the majority of people in Grand Bay are, are committed labor rights. They will not vote another party right now, but that 
but in the history of brandy, we've seen that change. Like for example, we had in the 60s, we had a representative called Rayland St. Louis. He was on the, with Edward Liblin. And St. Louis won two or three terms. And in 1970, Stanley Federal beat him. So the Grammy people actually shifted from labor to freedom. And, and then in 1985, they shift from freedom to labor, to Pierre Charles. Right? And they have remained labor since 85 to now. The question is, should I have political interests, which I probably still have, but um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I can't win in Grand Bay, but I would have a lot of work to do to win, because it's not, it, the numbers are not in my favor, because it's overwhelmingly labor, and that's the only reason. But I, it's not that I, I don't think I can win, I would have to do the work. Whether at this point in time I want to do that work, I'm not sure. At this age yeah. in your life. Yeah. At this point in your life. Yeah. Um, but, oh. but people still say at 60 you're still young, so <laughs> for politics. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Thank you. Oh hello, is it young? I'm listening to this program. Uh, uh, I want to just on behalf of you continuous of question with a thank you to the Excellency for the tremendous efforts that you have put into the Indonesia over the past couple of years. I think it's commendable. Um, I am certain that had you been elected in two thousand and nine that Dominica as a you know as a whole would have benefited benefited so much from you. We have once again lost the an opportunity to benefit from a good person. Um, I am confident that if you decide to put your effort into grant making and it will make a difference. I would like to encourage you to do that. I think it's something that you should do. But um, when we look at the history of this current government and uh, this current Labour Party, what we know is that it is a party that would eat of your bowl, eat of your flesh, suck of your bowl, eat up everything that you have, would chew up all of you and spit you out to the wolves when you're done. Uh, but you're a strong man, so you have to buy that. Um, you, have, uh, you have to buy that trash of the of the little party. And uh, if, it, if it's beyond being a liberal right or being any other affiliated to any other party right now, at this stage in Dominican development, it's about Dominican. Um, it's not about United Focus Party, it's not about Freedom Party, it's about Dominica. And I think that people of Dominica should come together. Good minded persons like yourself should come together and know that it is really not a party thing, but we need to save the commons of Dominica because um, for our children to come, uh, for our own retirement at a certain stage, we need to give Dominica some hope. And uh, I think that people should have people like you and a number of other persons. I think you have a lot more within you to give to this country. The people of Dominica are depending on you. I am looking forward to see what you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing I, I would say to that, I, I like your, your idea of, and um, I felt that we needed. Our people are too divided and to face the wrath of that hurricane after. We needed to come together. And I was expecting to see leadership from the ruling party to do that. But they have fallen in the partisan ways. And that cannot build the country. You cannot develop Dominica post Maria in a partisan way. And I, it's, we're just setting up the, this thing for failure, this reconstruction for failure, because it cannot be one set of people are the ones involved. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I can't hear you properly, so you need to either fix your phone or... Yes, please. I suspect you're laying down and you want to do this very comfortably. <laughs> Sit up. Sit up. <laughs> you still sound very distant. Well, yeah. go ahead. Let's see what we can get from you. Good evening, yes. I 
Wait, wait, caller, we're not hearing you. You're gonna have to try to probably um, try us back. Were you hearing him, Christian? No, I, no we, we're, I can we're hear like, a little bit. We, we're just hearing you very faintly and not sufficient for us to be able to decipher um, what it is that you are trying to say. So please, probably you can try us back. Let's take the overseas line. Good evening. Yes. How are you? Good evening, good evening. Good evening, I don't want to do this video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 well, it's, it's you want to hold my hand. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. Yes, yes. This is much better. Good yes. evening. Good evening. Yes. But Mr. Terry did not want you to be part of that because he claims to be because of your two world citizens. Yes. But I think it's not because of your citizens. Mr. Terry do not want anybody that is smarter than him and that can think. Because what is happening in the cabinet today, I don't see you. If you were in fact a true representative for the grand constituency, you would have been the only minister speaking up. Right. So Mr. Terry knows what you stand for. So he did not want to be part of the of the of the team. And 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 you know call and you know call. Yeah, go on. Well, I I certainly. Okay, Colin, you've made the point. Well, Thank what, you. I, what I want to say to that is that, uh, well, first of all, I, I can't vote in Grammy because I'm not on the Grammy list. I'm actually on the Kingsville list. Oh. That's where I used to live. So I, I, when I came back to Dominic, I thought I didn't vote where you live. And so I changed from Grammy. But there's one person that I would support, one labor writer I would support. I would support Ed Regis in Grammy. You would support Ed Regis? I would support Ed Regis in Grammy because um, the Labour Party will still win in Grammy. No matter what you what you do. So um, if I had to, I, I like I, I like Ed's politics. Ed was part of the, our group, um, PHR's group, and um, I think Ed Ed is like would be better place to pursue the legacy of PHR's more than his wife. Certainly more than his wife, and and for that I have some reverence for Ed. All right, we'll take this final overseas call. Good evening. I am well, and you? I can, very clearly. What is the idea? Yeah, girl, you always talk enough to me that's a blast here, man. Oh. <laughs> Ambassador, me. Craig Wall. So, yes, Mr. Craig Wall, how are you? I am fine. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Big 
guy who should be taking half the heavy position, man. We got to fire half the heavy and put you there. <laughs> because that. That sounds like a diaspora color. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much for your contribution. Yeah. You okay. too, my dear. Thank you so much. Yes, Crispy. Well, I, um, what did I say? I, I would like to um, say that I can't say no to politics. I mean, if, if the Grammy people were very serious and they felt that I could, they, they know that I can make a good contribution. But I'll tell you one thing I would not serve in this Labour Party again. Um, this, this current Labour Party is not a Labour Party. This is not the Dominic Labour Party. This is a hybrid party. It's a party that's not democratic. I, I, I was part of the group that built the Labour Party with Mike Douglas. And um, what we have today is not, that's not the legacy of the Labour Party. And um, I couldn't be part of that. And, and the, the previous caller talked about whether, um, um, if I was gotten elected, how would I have performed? The thing is that I don't think I would get along with Mr. Scary. I don't. I don't think my. I think my time, my tenure in his government would have been short-lived. And I'm happy that he is the one who took the step to block me from running. And it was an unfortunate thing for the Grammy people. And what this people like Tony Asterfan have the audacity to go on the radio and lie and say Tony Asterfan has been saying that I told him that I was never going to give up my U.S. citizenship and my wife was never going to give up her U.S. citizenship. Tony Asifan is not my friend. I have not talked to Tony Asifan since about 2008. I have no respect for Tony Asifan. I think he's nothing more than a gutter rat. And I really think that Tony Asifan is a stumbling block to de democratic development in Dominica. And he better behave himself. So if the thing that, that makes me discontent I'm not happy that the fact that, that the Prime Minister doesn't answer questions. He has Tony Asterfan as his mouthpiece. And I'm looking forward to the day when Mr. Skerritt will answer the questions and stop hiding behind Tony Asterfan's um, pants. 16 minutes past the 10 o'clock hour. What is Christine Gregoire up to right now? Well, I can say that I'm committed to a democratic Dominica, and I want to see uh, the first element of that is to have electoral reform, comprehensive electoral reform, not about this little list. The list is one part of it. I'm talking about, when I talk about comprehensive electoral reform, here's what I mean. A new voters list that's very, very critical. The campaign finance reform, I want to know where the Labour Party is getting their money to run elections and Labour rights have not given one dollar to the party. Where is that money coming from? So we need campaign finance reform so that people will have to declare and there will be limits on how much money that people can get for their campaign and how much foreigners can contribute to your campaign. These things have to have limits. Third. The, um, the, 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 some of the way that ballots are rejected in Dominica needs to be addressed. And, and too much discretion is given to presiding officers as to whether a ballot is valid or not. So that's, that's what. Um, I, um, I can simply say, I can't remember all the issues now, but the, the OAS and the Commonwealth Observer Missions have put it in black and white. What is Deficient, deficient in Dominica the electoral machinery, and there are many deficiencies. Voting, voter ID cards. So long the government said that they were working on voter ID cards. It's already seven years, and they cannot produce one card. We should not have elections in Dominica without voter ID cards. We should not have elections in Dominica without a revised list of people who live in Dominica. I'm totally opposed to the idea of people living in the diaspora who don't pay taxes here coming in to vote for one day and leave just to give advantage to one political party. We should not tolerate that. And I'm saying that the Commonwealth said something which is very important, that the last election was not fair. 
we have to have elections of integrity and we have to have elections that are fair and I'm hoping, I'm asking and I'm begging the Roosevelt Skerritt administration to give Dominican once and for all comprehensive electoral reform. What is We Are Dominica Inc? Yes, We Are Dominica Inc is a, is a, 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 a Dominica diaspora association um, of a um, very interesting group of people in New York. Most of them are in New York, but some are in other states. And um, it is a, a group to help Dominica through our own efforts. Um, I, I have been serving as the executive. It's sort of like a part-time role. And um, meeting people who could give us donations. We, we, sent, we sent a container here in April. Um, we sent medical supplies, uh, which went to the central medical stores, some of it went to the Postman Hospital and the Wesley Health Center. And um, we also gave solar touchlights to all the students in the Northeast um, Secondary School. And we have some more for some other schools. Um, but now, many homes have electricity. So we'll only be focusing on homes that don't have electricity and students that don't have electricity at their home to do their homework. So come September next, in the next couple of weeks, we will be giving some solar lights to some schools and yes. We intend to continue assisting Dominica, like for example, one of, this, one of, the, one of the students who is a, an athlete, her name is Shani Angol mm -hmm. from Granby, she's a javelin thrower. We, we, we assisted her going to Cloud Community College in Kansas City. And um, we worked with the Marigot Development Corporation on that. That was a joint venture. Um, we have we also gave medical assistance to somebody from Dominica who got sick during the hurricane. They had to come to the U.S. for medical attention. We gave money towards that. Um, we 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 sent in the very early days after the hurricane. We sent three thousand pounds of medical supplies airlifted from Texas to Kingfield Airport. Um, we continue to do um, assistance to um, people. We believe in people-to-people -people development. And we will be focusing on some schools. I know the Bagatelle School is one of the schools we have already picked. We are all, there's one person who's interested in us doing something in Pichler, Pichler School, which I really want to do. Um, and then we also will be working with Calinago as well. It is 10.21 p.m. <laughs> yes, we've been talking a while, Mr. Gregor, yes. <laughs> and we're coming slowly towards the end of the program, and what a, quite a program it has been, quite informative, and um, of course, uh, we touched on just about every aspect of your life, Yes. but I suspect you're very passionate about the political aspect. I am, but you know, I also think about at a time when I'll just be a farmer. I, I like farming. I, yes. mean, I, I, I could see coming back to Dominica and just whatever years I have, I'll do farming. I'll, I, I'm going to certainly replant my farm. Um, there's a river there. I plan to do hydroponics. I plan to do, um, but mainly what I'm working on is turmeric. Okay. And I hope I can do, I can do a processing of turmeric here. And once you, once you process turmeric, you can do a whole range of things. You can make curry, you can, you can make capsules from turmeric. Um, and it's, it's great for cuisine, for cooking, you know. Um, so turmeric and ginger are the two. And both of them are climate resilient crops. And that's important. That's very important in this age that we're in. All right. So when you leave, um, I guess you leave sometime soon to go back to New York. I will go back by the, next, by the end of this week. By the end of this week? Yeah. What, what are you going back to? I go back to New York. I, I do a lot of consulting. Sometimes I teach, but this fall term I won't teach. Um, I am working on some projects in, 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 in Africa. Mm -hmm. Tanzania is one of them. and um, So I may make a couple trips early in the year. And then I'm focused on what's happening in Dominica. I'll, I'll always, always be focused on what's happening in Dominica. Um, I, I am also big in culture. So I love supporting cultural groups, and, and one of the things that I've been supporting over the last six years is football. I send footballs, hundreds of footballs, to the Portersville um, Youth Football Academy. I've given football to um, Grand Fond and La Plaine and Portsmouth and Grand Bay. Um, I, there's a donor who gives us footballs, and I've made it available to the um, youth 
So I'm very interested in sports for youth and keep the youth engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and the most important thing for youth is just to learn to read and write. Because if you can learn to read and write well, there's nothing that you cannot learn. And so, so that is going to be important. And then it's so critical to know your history, but up to this point, um, I think Dr. Leonard Tonichich has done some very good work. Yes, indeed. Um, and we hope we, Dominic, and we'll add to that work and we'll find out more things as we do that research. As we wrap up with Ambassador Crispin Gregoire on the In the Spotlight radio show tonight. We're going to give him the opportunity from, for some final comments. And we wrap it up on the program tonight. Well, um, I would say that I'm really I'm concerned about Dominican's future and stability. And I would like to, I, I accept the fact that Dominica is split politically and um, there's been, not even the hurricane would bring us together. I, I think that's rather unfortunate. And, and, I, and I lay that at the feet of the people in power because the people in power should have leaned backwards and, and bring the opposition on board. But what they've done is undermine the opposition. I mean, when you have so-called caretakers from the ruling party in constituencies that the opposition um, uh, represents, undermining the power rep with so-called caretakers, that cannot be good for bipartisanship and, and the kind of unity that we need to build this country back. So I, I, I see a lot of flaws in the whole process of reconstruction. And if we don't arrest these flaws, we'll, we'll have problems in this country later on. And I hope we, you know, reason prevails and Dominica will be a stable country. Democratic and stable. And with that, he puts on his sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Crispin Gregoire, it was indeed my absolute pleasure to have you here tonight uh, on the program. And I want to urge those of you who are out there, or if you know someone out there who should be on the program, when they're in Dominica, let me know when they're coming, let me know when they're visiting. You can contact me on 275-7565, that is the, the number that I use for this program and other such related things. So you can call me, contact me, WhatsApp me, whatever the case might be. You can drop me an email in the spotlight.da at gmail.com. Let me know you're coming, send me a message, right? Well, the Facebook Messenger is not very, I'm not very reliable with that one. <laughs> Because I've reached my, my maximum of friends on that yeah. and um, you know sometimes people send me messages and yeah. because they're not my friend I have to accept the message and all of that and sometimes that can be a challenge so but you can contact me on 275-7565 and uh, for those of you who know my other number then that's okay as well uh, but feel free make contact with me let me have persons like Mr. Greg Gregoire coming here and share their story with us this is what this is all about it's all about uh, learning about our people, experiencing their, 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 their life stories, learning from them, um, being inspired by them, being motivated by them, whatever the case is. And that is what I want to do with this program, just to hear the stories of our great Dominicans on island, outside of Dominica, making a contribution, um, outstanding Dominicans, and that's what this is all about. So let me know, you know, if you come and give me some notice, you know, so I can, if I have to shift the schedule around, whatever the case might be, but we want to know when our people are here that we get the opportunity to hear from them. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight to the program. If you listened via Q95, 95.1, if you listened via WISE Q95, uh, uh, the website, if you listened, uh, if you viewed on, um, on, on Facebook, we're very, very happy to have you. Leave us a comment. We appreciate if you leave us a comment as well. And remember to make suggestions, you know, of persons that you would like to have on the program and on that note we wrap it up and say thank you again to ambassador crispin gregor we wish him a safe trip when he returns back uh, to new york we hope that he comes back soon and continues to make his contribution to dominica 
that is a wrap. Let me just say thank you to everyone who supported in one way or another in making this happen. Thank you, Mr. Gregoire. And um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. We will be back here next week, Monday. Until then, do have a pleasant night. Thank you. Thank you. This was good. Yes. Don't get up.